Oh, Melinda, do you need to record? Thanks. <laughs> there we go. There's my recording. All right. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us um, for this wonderful afternoon. This is the RTD Accountability Committee, the Governance Subcommittee. Um, and so we're going to kick it off. Um, in the packet for today, you should have seen the meeting summary for March 15th. Um, feel free to review those notes. And if there's any changes uh, that you see need to be made, please um, reach out to Dr. Cox staff and we could get those updated. So the first thing on our agenda today is actually um, a draft partnership recommendation. So hopefully everyone could um, see that in their packet. If not, um, I'm sure we'll, we'll put the recommendation up here in a second um, for discussion and review. So Doug, do I kick this off to you? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you very okay. much. Great. Yeah, so as I mentioned at the end of the last meeting when uh, we were kind of transitioning, I said I'd try to put pen to paper and come up with something to uh, based on the conversations that have been had at previous meetings and the like and provide back to you for your comments and discussion and all that kind of good stuff. So I will share my screen here real quick. Okay, you see my screen? I'm yes. Okay, good, 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 good. So these are the recommendations I, uh, I came up with and I'll just run through them quickly and then we can have a conversation about those. So um, basically this is, the, the, these recommendations from the governance subcommittee um, are built on the recommendations that the full accountability committee, uh, rec I guess approves for consideration by RTD associated with uh, the COVID uh, relief funding uh, information. And I included that as, a, as the second attachment to this agenda item, just to refresh your memories. But there were some very specific um, partnership recommendations in there related to, um, you know, uh, you know, possibilities of how to use the COVID relief funding. So that's kind of built off of this. Um, so the first um, is to leverage existing and new partnerships to improve service efficiency and grow ridership, right? RTD should emphasize partnerships with local governments and employers or employment centers who have unique understanding of local mobility needs. The second is, um, uh, is basically to work with existing mobility service providers, whether that be um, uh, you know, other transit agencies, most notably VIA on, on the north side of town. Um, and that was, we had that discussion fairly early on with regards to opportunities to work in partnership with, with VIA. And listen, I'm gonna say all this knowing that RTD already has established partnerships with VIA and others, many others. Um, if you remember, we provided some documentation that uh, RTD staff provided us. That was several meetings ago. Um, it kind of lists all the partnerships that they do have currently available. And quite frankly, I was I was um, very surprised and pleasantly surprised at the at the um, at the partnerships that they've already established. But also, um, you know, with Uber and Lyft to begin to explore those options again and. Um, as Deborah correctly pointed out last time, there are some concerns in working with the TNCs with uh, proprietary information and their their lack of willingness of sharing that data, and you know whether there's opportunities that kind of you know mitigate those issues. I think is worth worth exploring. I know Dr. Cogger sells as far as our transportation for older adults. We do have contracts with Uber and Lyft, so I understand some of the complexities associated with contracting with TNCs. Um, but hopefully there are ways to get around that from RTD's perspective as well. The next one is something that we had been calling challenge grants for a while. Um, I, uh, I kind of, I, quite frankly, I did what most everybody does. I Google search challenge grant and uh, it came back and I didn't think it really kind of fit exactly what we had, what, what we had um, really talked about. So I changed that uh, to innovation grant, same, 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 uh, you know, at least theoretically the same, same concept and idea. Um, but ultimately what we'd like to do, um, at least in the conversations that have been had in the subcommittee is, is to allow, kind of just throw it out on the street, right? Are there, are there, are there um, groups out there, 
whether they be private sector, for-profit folks, or some other nonprofits that might have some ideas about how we can improve um, uh, uh, or increase ridership within our areas for um, maybe, uh, as Rod likes to point out, um, you know, for those areas that are uh, probably a distance away from fixed route service, are there other ways that we can provide service for, for those folks? And um, the last two are, are, are similar, I guess, in some respect, or at least tied. One is to develop a public facing dashboard, which we know there are conversations occurring associated with that at the operations subcommittees having those discussions, but um, to be to share the existing and highlight the existing partnerships. Because again, as I was, I was unaware of the, just the, um, you know, just the degree of the number of partnerships that RTD currently has available. And I think that would be useful information to share with the public. And last but not least, um, and, I'm, and again, this is maybe something that RTD currently does is to evaluate those existing con uh, partnerships to ensure um, that the, you know, the effectiveness of those partnerships are two-way and with an opportunity to rescope those, those relationships to ensure maximum benefit. So that's what I came up with based on conversations. I'll throw it back to you, Madam Chair, to, to coordinate the discussion. All right, well, thank you. Okay, so um, let's open it up to the floor. Thoughts, comments? concerns um, with the draft recommendation? Anyone want to kick us off? Oh, Jackie, I see you have your hand raised. Thank you. Go yeah, ahead. I'm finally learning to follow the rules. So I'm going to lower <laughs> my hand now. But um, I, I thought uh, that these were great partnership recommendations, but I couldn't help think as I read through these, not one of them would exactly meet what Lone Tree is doing right now. Right now, Lone Tree is playing for its, for its own intra-city transit. We pay the taxes to RTD, but we're still supplementing that and we're providing this very valuable service which supports RTD ridership. And I don't see a direct opportunity. Um, it's not really what I would call an innovation grant. It's actually just doing something that I would suggest RTD should be doing um, and doing it better. And I do think RTD should be partnering with us on our, their flex ride dollars. So I guess just a question for Doug as far as that, where do you see you know, communities like mine that have kind of leaned in, uh, we can just continue to spend money, <laughs> our money, but I would like to see some ability to partner with, with RTD on that, that one. And then the other one, um, you know, when Lone Tree kind of kicked off its, uh, its um, link on demand shuttle, on demand service, we originally partnered through Uber and we found them extremely challenging to deal with. And they were not, they did not move on the data sharing, which made it really hard for us to kind of program, uh, for us to understand how our dollars were being spent. We couldn't even get good data on where they were picking people up and dropping them off. So mm -hmm. I do think that that's gonna be an ongoing challenge working with, I don't know if Lyft is any better. Um, so uh, those were my two comments. So I, I, I'd first love to hear a reaction about how we might be able to incorporate something, um, it's a cost sharing of an existing service, I would even suggest. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, if I may, uh, Mayor, yeah, I, to, to your point, so with regards to the cost sharing uh, concept, I think it's kind of baked in the first one, but you're right, we can provide examples and kind of just, you know, kind of expand that a little bit. I think you're right. It's about, you know, the cost sharing or subsidizing maybe local service um, where it has been proven to be successful or, you know, something to that nature. But I, but we could definitely add some additional language in there, if not here in the final report, sure. Yeah. Doug, I almost think they should try and incentivize, if they would just give us the, the, the dollars that they're spending to kind of do the same thing, uh, we would be doing it and be able to do more, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting word for sure, incentivize. Yeah, we can include that in there. Um, and to the Uber lifts of the world, yeah, your, your, your points are definitely noted. And that is um, that's an issue that, that Deborah Johnson expressed at the last meeting too, Jackie, with regards to you know, some of the just getting the data from, from the TNCs has been, has been uh, very difficult at best. Yeah, Elise, and then I'll do you, Rhett. Thanks. Um, 
I generally thought these were good. I, I, I like Jackie's edition as well. I also thought since we first made our recommendations to RTD about how to spend um, CRISA funding, there are additional pots of revenue that are likely to come down the pike for RTD that will enable them to potentially implement more of our recommendations. Um, you know, we have more federal stimulus dollars and we might um, likely see infrastructure dollars as well. So I guess I, I, I'd like to see us to reiterate that um, or add a recommendation that as funding opportunities arise that um, RTD consider um, implement, implementing more of these partnership ideas that we had. Did that, did that make sense? Just to sort of keep yeah. those fresh? Because we just gave our recommendations for CRISA, but our recommendations should apply to any, um, any type of funds that are flowing in this, in this year at least, or next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's an important point to clarify, for sure. Um, right. Hey, I, I, Madam Go Chair, ahead. I may Rut, just real quick on, on that point. I just wanted to make, uh, just want to point out that that Deborah did did write us back on the recommendations that that were provided on Chrissa. Thank you, Deborah, very very much for that. And uh, we're planning on sharing that in the full uh, RTD accountability agenda, which will go out in, in the next couple of days. So just kind of FYI. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Rhett. You know, it, it seems like uh, for you, Jackie, it would be essential to have that where they were picked up, where they were dropped off, because you provide a very generous uh, uh, service throughout that throughout the Lone Tree area. And not all those riders wind up at a light rail station, but enough of them do that there's a part of, of your cost that should be offset by that particularly your subsidies. And I understand if I remember right, did you say $4 was your subsidy on your, on your ridership program? The average cost is $6 a ride. $6. Boy, that's, that's a fairly operationally efficient program. So it will be interesting to, the other thing that, that the partnerships could expand to is essentially putting together a meeting where you and other people like VIA sit down and say, here's how we're doing this. And here's what's working and here's what we'd like to be able to do better. So part of it could just be a, a, an effective way to, to brainstorm among the different groups that want to do this with the people that have done it successfully. And the last thing I'd say is we are working on that, the idea of a first last mile. Um, Day is involved in that too and Julie is welcome to jump in. But how, you know, how we could do that at a reasonably low cost. And I tell you, it is challenging because these TNCs want to hold everything as close to them as they can. That's their, you know, where where they're picking up and dropping off for them is is core uh, core information uh, for their own co uh, competitiveness. Hey, Julie, could I add something that Brett and, and Elise's comments made me sure. think about? it's almost expanding on these competitive innovation grant programs because I, I almost would love RTD to identify some things, even the paratransit service, you know, is there somebody else that could be doing this at a lower cost that just specializes in this? And it, it, I, I almost, my recommendation would be for them to do, go through kind of an an internal review identifying some programs, perhaps it's the paratransit, um, perhaps it's the, um, uh, uh, not just Accessoride, I'm drawing a complete blank it on what they count. call it, but uh, you know, FlexRide, thank you. Flex it's the FlexRide services where they identify the objectives that they want accomplished and see what the private sector and partnership with local governments could come up with to achieve those objectives. So it, again, it's more of this incentivizing and more just saying, hey, these are some things that, like I can identify them within the city of Lone Tree. Like some things that, gosh, I wish we had somebody else we could kind of pass this off to or contract this out to. Um, and I'd like to see more of that in here. 
Well, it would be great for you to sit down with the VIA people because they are so impressive in terms of the efficiency of the services that they've been able to deliver and the cost effectiveness of those services. Great, thank you guys. So um, one of the things that I saw as an opportunity is that first bullet, just talking about leveraging existing and new partnerships. I think we should also include TMOs um, in that since you know our TMO up here was really crucial in providing much needed workforce transit that wasn't available. Um, and so, you know, maybe just expanding um, that first bullet a little bit. It, Any it, other? My ignorance, what's a TMO? Transportation Management Organization. Okay, so a nonprofit or are they necessarily yeah, not? Uh, so yeah, like ours is Smart Commute Metro North. Okay. And we have one down here other, from Denver South. We call it a TMA, transportation. Oh, I mean, yeah, but okay. they're the same things. Exactly, yeah. I have something new to learn. Any, I know, any other thoughts or recommendations for Doug, feedback? Go ahead, Dale. Yeah, Julie, I just wanted to um, touch on the first bullet point. I think. I think it makes a lot of sense, including TMOs. I wonder if we should broaden it to to say rather than employers or employment centers, or maybe it's implied in there, but anchor institutions. Um, I'm thinking of yeah. the universities and at least what we learned from some of the universities and just the amount of they're basically little TMOs. <laughs> um, so it might be worth it to bring that up in here. Yeah, no, I think that's a great ad. Huge employment centers could be like that too. Well, we already have employment centers. So. All right, never mind. All right. Any other feedback for Doug before we move on? Anyone else from the group want to jump in? I'm not seeing a chat feature. I'm not sure why, but if I'm missing something, just unmute and chat, shout it out. All right. I think that's that's the feedback so far, Doug, and I'm sure you're going to hear more from other groups as you continue to to make your rounds with the subcommittees. Um, so uh, hopefully that helps a little bit um, and helps evolve uh, the recommendations. Any, yeah, help. Anything else you need from us? No, I don't think so. Not on this topic, unless I mean, if there's I mean, was there anything that you heard today as far as comments that you did not like or didn't don't think they should be included in there? Because it's easy to incorporate the stuff that we talked about, for sure. Just want to make sure. No, I actually agreed with a lot of the comments that folks brought forward. Perfect. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, I think we're all on the same page. Great. All right. Well, thank you for bringing that and, and you know, starting with that draft and, and bringing it to this group. I think it's a good step in the right direction, and um, we'll continue to, to hash that out. Um, okay. So our next. Uh, agenda item is starting off our next conversation, which is RTD service area. And we have Annie Rice. Annie, would you like to introduce yourself to this group and then um, kick it off with your topic? We're excited that you're here. Yeah, thanks for having me at the meeting, everyone. My name is Annie Rice. Um, I'm a research assistant with Dr. Cog, and I'm also getting my master's in urban and regional planning graduating this spring um, and excited to be in the real world with all of you. I tried um, to talk her out of it. <laughs> so let me just share my screen. Alrighty. Um, so I put together a short presentation um, to kick off the conversation about the RTD service area. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, densities and demographics in the Denver region and the RTD district. So just a recap, these were the four initial guiding questions for the governance subcommittee. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on the first two questions in this presentation, looking at is RTD's service area too large and are constituents receiving adequate service. So I'll be providing some background information on density and demographics. So just to start off, this 
um, this map isn't super surprising. Um, the densest areas in the Denver region are um, in the urban core. But what is surprising is how much of the RTD district covers tracks where there are fewer than one person per acre, um, especially in the Northwest and Southwest areas of the RTD district. This next map um, shows employment density in the RTD service area, and it's a pretty similar picture with much of the district also covering fewer places with fewer than one job per acre. This map um, combines the previous two, looking at both population and employment density in the RTD service area. So areas that are more pink have a lot of people per acre and areas that are more blue have more jobs per acre, while the darker purple areas have both a lot of people and jobs in the same place. So for example, out by DIA um, and in Boulder and Longmont, um, there are several tracks where there are a lot of jobs per acre, but fewer people. Um, and then this map kind of combines what you just saw. So this shows people and jobs per acre all in one. Um, and the areas where there are no color have fewer than eight people and jobs per acre. Um, the light purple has eight to 16 people in jobs per acre. And then the darkest purple shows places that are far more dense with both population and employment. But you can see in this map again that much of the RTD district is covering areas with very few people in jobs per acre. So why does this all matter? Uh, this guides where RTD chooses to provide fixed route transit service. So what you see in this table um, are some of RTD's guidelines about where they provide service and to what densities. So um, call and ride services areas where there are three to 12 residents and employees per acre. Uh, RTD provides local service, um, generally where there are 12 or more residents and employees per acre. Um, and then in their recent BRT study, they're, they're targeting areas with more than 17 residents and employees per acre. Um, and this is a typical thing for transit agencies to provide fixed route service where certain density thresholds are met um, because routes are more efficient and financially sustainable um, when they can pick up more passengers uh, with fewer, fewer miles traveled. Um, and then on the contrary, fixed route lines that serve lower density out, outer areas, they're covering greater, greater distances to serve fewer riders, uh, which makes them a lot more expensive. Um, and then serving areas with higher densities also exponentially increase transit demand. So there's, there's that to consider as well. But uh, this brings the question, um, given that many areas within RTD service area do have lower, lower densities, how can RTD uh, serve those places maybe without fixed route transit, but using some other transportation option or technology? Um, so what options exist to cover areas that have those lower densities, but also for that matter, in places where there are super high densities, up to 270 people in jobs per acre, um, how, can, how can RTD serve those areas, maybe even beyond fixed route transit and improve service in the urban core? So going on, um, I also pulled some statistics on vulnerable populations in the RTD district. So this map is showing the distribution of non-white residents in the Denver region. And that's, it, it pretty much mimics the population and employment density maps. Uh, there's also, um, this shows low income residents in the Denver region. And this shows residents with disabilities. Um, so all of these maps of the more vulnerable populations RTD is trying to serve uh, mimics the maps that we've seen prior. So just to show some overall summary statistics of this, um, 
this shows all, all of RTD's districts, um, their population, jobs, area, density, and then uh, a key for the geography that these districts represent. So um, it's clear looking at the population column that these districts were, were drawn to achieve roughly equal populations which with, within each of the districts, around 200,000 people per district. Um, but each district does not have the same densities within. So districts range from about 24 people in jobs per acre in District A or Denver to just 0.6 people in jobs per acre in District N representing Jefferson County. Um, but it's also important to note that these are average densities within each district. So in Denver, for example, some, some tracks within Denver are more than 40 people in jobs per acre, but others are under 10 people in jobs per acre. And then even in the most suburban districts, there are places that exceed 10 people in jobs per acre, but much of those districts are under one person in job per acre. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, the size of Jefferson County. It's huge. It's a lot of land area. So the people are spread more thinly. Um, so I can, I can go back to this, but just to recap, um, this conversation covered the first two questions here. Um, but it does bring up questions about what the optimal service size and transit service options are um, for communities given the density and demographics of the region. Um, and I've got some additional research on possible uh, service options like micro transit to cover some, um, some of these communities if fixed route transit is infeasible, but uh, that's probably going to be a subsequent conversation. So um, I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you so much for uh, that presentation. Um, questions or comments from uh, the group? Anyone have any further questions you'd like to ask, Annie? Yeah, it's me again. I, I raised my hand. <laughs> Do it. I, I, there's three people who did it at once. So okay, I'll go sorry. with you, Jackie. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. I jumped again as usual, but you guys know you me. You did great. Uh, hey, um, I had a question about what the year, what is the year of this data, uh, Annie? And great it's, job, but. Yeah, of course. It's ACS, American Community Survey 2019 data. Okay. Because I, I think I always question this because the, uh, the Lone Tree extension happened in at the end of May, June of 2019. So I'm just always curious if that in if that includes those that data for that year. And my next follow up question is, how do you account for future development and growth? Uh, and I know you're not going to do it, but how how should as we look at right sizing a district? How do you account for where we're going to see additional population and jobs coming? And, and planning for that kind of service. And that's not, that's kind of a rhetorical out to the body. So thank you. I did, I did create some maps using uh, Dr. Cog's population forecast, but that's households and jobs. So I decided not to cover those, but I can, I can share those maps of 2020 versus 2050 as well, if you're interested. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, I saw Elise. Go ahead, jump in. Um, I was just curious um, how this data compares to other peer agencies in terms of sort of the distant, the distinction between our urban areas and our non-urban areas and our service area. I know that we have one of the largest service areas. I guess I'm curious whether or not we, other transit agencies have to deal with um, the differences in density as much as we do? That's a, that's a good question. Um, you're right that De the Denver region is unique in that we have a transit agency that covers our entire metropolitan area where some might have multiple smaller transit agencies covering 
the communities, but um, that's probably a subject of further research for me. I think we, uh, at least Madam Chair, if I may, I, I think we have recorded, um, or at least we've, we've gotten some information, uh, some general information about the size of other districts and some of the the uh, the governance matrix stuff that we've done, as well as some additional work that our consultant has done. Um, so we might be able to, to kind of put all that together and get you some additional information just on you know size and density and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, I remember seeing the size. I just don't remember seeing yeah. the density. Mm -hmm. I'd just yeah. be curious how others deal with it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's pretty readily available. I think you know most folks have that in kind of their background you know, introductory slides to their uh, service agency. Okay, great, thank you. Rhett, do I see your hand? There we go. Um, the, in, in looking at the first mile, last mile uh, ideas, one of the things that really struck me is that it isn't just there's a lot of people here. It's also whether there are people who are good candidates for being for using transit. And in some cases, it's people that they may not have a car, so that you know puts them out of the range of the park and ride lots, or or you know they're because they're lower income, they're more likely to to use transit. It doesn't mean we don't want to provide transit for higher income people, but in terms of how we draw more people, if you're looking at a market, you have to say, is this a market that will buy our product? And uh, I, I tend to think that in some of these neighborhoods, they'd use transit if they could get there. And so uh, it's kind of a demographic factor that it's really interesting to look at uh, in some of your work, but it has to be brought down to the neighborhood level. And there is data at a neighborhood level in a lot of this stuff. So. Hopefully it's one of the things that we can look at in planning. You know, the last thing we want is a bunch of cars running around to pick people up when there's nobody there that wants a ride. So um, part of deciding to do pilots is I think going to be in having a good uh, methodology for evaluating that market opportunity to speak like an old, you know, startup guy, market opportunity. But it's really a, a service opportunity. It's really how do we get transit to the people that need it the most? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things that um, I was thinking about when, you know, just kind of reviewing the packet for today, um, and I and I want to bring this to the committee because I want to make sure that you know I'm clear on your expectations for this as well. Um, so we're looking at. Um, whether or not the size and structure of RTD service area is appropriate. And um, so what, you know, I guess to put it back to step one, you know, what problems um, are we trying to solve with this conversation? And where do we really want to hone in on this conversation um, over the next couple weeks? Um, and what information would be most helpful for these, for committee members on this call? Um, regarding this topic, um, just to give, you know, Doug, make sure Doug has a, a clear idea of what other information we'd like to see. Annie, I think your presentation was fantastic and I, I really appreciated the data um, aspect. And so um, I think this is a good way of just, you know, starting off this conversation, talking about the direction we want to take this um, and what further um, needs we need. Thoughts on that? Hmm. Go ahead, Jackie. So uh, I, I feel like, um, and, and I, I think the bill was introduced for the community of Douglas County community to my east for Parker to withdraw from um, RTD. And so I think uh, there is a sense uh, from some communities, and I'll just speak parochially in Douglas County, that they're really not getting a service level and they're paying for it. So they would rather keep the taxes locally and identify the service that they want to provide. And, and there's a part of me that questions from RTD's perspective, are these um, areas that have a lower 
job uh, resident, you know, less than one per acre or, or does it make sense even from the district standpoint to keep those communities within R RTD? And has RTD done any analysis of kind of right sizing themselves um, to, to identify uh, some parameters? And, and I know you have to account, what I would always caution is account for growth. Because if you looked at Lone Tree 10 years ago, we wouldn't, it, we wouldn't qualify or wouldn't have made sense. And right now we've got 10,000 jobs within feet of a light rail station. So that, so, you know, you have to be forward thinking in it, but has RTD done any analysis to say there's a different level of service that we, for, for the areas that are zoned and will remain uh, low density and low jobs, uh, a different service level that we're, we would, we would, um, that we're gonna be providing there. And maybe it doesn't make sense to keep those areas they're not probably not getting a lot of tax revenue from them either. I mean, on both sides of that equation, right? So has any internal work on that ever been done? I'm not sure if there's anyone from RTD who can answer that. If there is, feel free to unmute and jump in. So this is Deborah Johnson, General Manager and CEO. I believe Bill Van Meter is on this call and I think he would be best suited to address that with his longevity and history of the organization. Thanks. All right. I know you Bill, love me. You're able to yeah, Bill, I know you love me putting on the spot with this question, but I, I just feel like in, you know, it, make, mm -hmm. it, it makes sense. Well, and, and you know, if Bill's not able to jump on the call, then, you know, that's definitely something that, you know, we could put out there as a good, I think it's a great question, Jackie, because there are certain areas in my county that, you know, they don't have service, yet they are paying into a system. So what, I mean, is, I don't know, what what is the best approach at that point? Ron, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. Ron Papsdorf. I, I don't think I can answer Mayor Malay's question directly. I, I would offer this for the group to consider, though. And, and, and it's tricky. How, how do you gauge the value of just having a regional transit system available? Um, whether you have a bus that goes directly by your house or not, is there value to an area just by virtue of having access to a regional transit system? And even if you don't ride transit every single day, Maybe your family takes transit into uh, downtown Denver to access a sporting venue a few times a year. And that's valuable to you because you avoid parking fees downtown or other hassles of getting downtown. And, I, and I'm just offering that other point of view that, you know, just like, just like a regional highway system that, you know, some people may never get on a freeway system, but there's value to having that system available, which is why you pay into it because other people use it, you get goods delivered to your house or to the store you shop at. And I think the same can be applied to transit. Um, there, there's inherent value in having it available, even if you even if you never ride it. And I just, I think that needs to be kept in mind. And I completely agree with that, Ron. I guess my question though is at some point, if <laughs> the person that's gonna come in and use it, maybe to go to a Rockies game or whatever, we'll, we'll pay a fee and, and it's gonna be subsidized. They're not gonna pay the true cost of what it, what it would be. But if there is never going to be any kind of service or micro transit to the community, at least to the, to the main, you know, down Parker Road, if there's not, you know, if there, if there really isn't ever plans to do that, does it really make sense to charge those fees for some of these outer regional areas. I think it's a dent to me, it's, it goes back to the density jobs issues. And once you get beyond a certain point, there seems to me there should be a threshold. So if you, and, and if there's an intention to ever, if it's some kind of micro transit service, great, then keep them in the district, but give them some level of service, in my opinion. All right, so we have lots of hands up here. Right, I'm gonna go with you, then I'll do Doug, Elise, and Dea. Just, just to comment on what Ron had to say, the, one of the biggest advantages of a transit system, you, you'll 
you would see if it didn't exist and you were trying to drive into work on I-25. There are a lot of people that benefit from a transit system just because it takes more people off the road and, and eases traffic. So that's, that's one of the big things. The other thing I wanted to throw out is the idea that maybe a better solution in the long term for RTD is not to have just a fixed service area, but be able to dynamically expand it or contract it depending on uh, where people wanted it and where the service opportunity was, make it more driven by uh, market forces and demand. Yeah, I know it's a very different model than what we have right now, but it's it's worth thinking out of the box on this one, some I think. Yeah, great, thank you. Doug? Thank you, Madam Chair. Rush, that's very interesting. I'm think about that a little more about, yeah, about a dynamic kind of, kind of boundary. Um, it's obviously very static now. Yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of elaborate on what Ron has said, or at least agree with Ron, and it was really one of our recommendations as part of our um, sub-regional service council concept, right? Is that, you know, RTD to provide what the value of this, the service that they get, because there is value to being um, linked to a larger, you know, region-wide system, right? And that that um, shouldn't be underappreciated. Um, I think sometimes it is. But I, I'll, I'll say this, you know, the two original questions that were kind of asked as part of this presentation today, is the RTD district too large? Well, I mean, I guess, yeah, probably is simply because for one, you know, I mean, there's a national park included in the boundary. I mean, you know, so this, you know, so is it, can you adjust the boundary to accommodate stuff like that? Sure. I think the most important thing from my perspective, at least, is that, um, you know, if you're having conversations about shrinking the size of the boundary, um, you, you know, you want that the folks that are that are on the outside looking in, or those that quite frankly are on the perimeter, on the edges are not disenfranchised, right? That there is still service that's available to those folks. And I know Rod talks about this all the time too, with regards to, you know, microtransit and the options associated with that. And, and um, you know, it should be like that, um, the schematic that Annie showed that, you know, talks about the densities and the types of services that would be offered based on those densities. That was done in 2016, right? I mean, a lot has changed in the last three, four years with regards to how TNCs operate and other microtransit opportunities that, um, um, you know, maybe the reimagined RTD folks, for example, and this could probably be a recommendation for us should, should take that up, right? And, and have conversations about, you know, changing that schematic um, a little bit. But anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, Jackie, we will reach out to RTD staff and have a conversation to see if they've done any internal exercises um, and, and we'll get back to you next meeting. Thank you. Great, thank you, Elise. Um, I, a variation of what Rut was saying, a lot of people travel to jobs um, that, that go on highways that are clogged with traffic. So there's the benefit exists, but also air quality, we're out of attainment for ozone and climate targets, right? We're all feeling the impacts of climate. RTD is a solution. So even if you don't get on the bus, they're providing a benefit to you and your community that we are not currently quantifying in any way that um, benefits RTD, but does benefit the, the communities even in far flung areas of the metro area. We need to figure out how to, to assess that benefit. Um, I think Jackie's point about managing expectations about what you get if you're paying into the RTD district is something that, that we should care about, RTD should care about, because not everybody's going to be able to have super rich transit if they have really, really low densities. And that's the reality of it. So there's probably some public education component about the benefits of RTD, even if you never ride a, a train or a bus. Yep, great point, Elise. Dea? Yeah, I just wanted to echo um, what what Rut was lifting up. I, I think back to Houston and how they were almost operating like these circulators of some sort, kind of more of a dynamic system to meet the needs where, I mean, their, their, land, their land is very spread out and the density might not necessarily be there. So there's some similarities there, but just how do we think about offering some level of service if that is what that community needs and only if that's what that community needs, um, but without having, let's say a fixed route or something else. I, I just worry that if we do 
offer a fixed route, we're taking that away from a community that relies on transportation. Um, and we're doing what I think RTD has done, and at least what I continually hear, just spreading the peanut butter too thin. And rather, how do we actually think about um, right sizing the services to where we need to right size the services? Yeah, thank you, Daya. So I have Matthew, and then I'm going to go to you. Okay, Lynn. Um, go ahead, Matthew. Really quick, um, I was going to put this in the chat box, but I couldn't seem to find the chat box in this new platform. Um, the, uh, the National Transit Database includes information and profiles for every transit agency in the country that uh, could be used to calculate density of their service area. Great, thank you, Matthew. <laughs> um, all right, go ahead, Lynn. Great, thanks. Uh, two, two quick things. I was just texting with Bill Saroy, who uh, works with Bill Van Meter, and, and uh, um, he reminded that the um, service area is within the scope of reimagine. So it is a, um, an item that we'll be looking at in the reimagine committees and then coming to the board. And then just one uh, sort of factual piece as I'm thinking through this. Um, I represent you know, Western Boulder County and uh, as Annie did, great job, Annie. Um, as she said, you know, that area and uh, Jeffco are areas that, that show really low density. Um, and you kind of have to think about, about this as specific population areas because the Netherland bus is a very popular bus. It goes up to Eldora. The people in Netherland have taxed themselves to have an eco pass. Um, for the whole town. Um, and so it's, a, it's an important bus. Lyons is, is an area that we're working out some other, um, uh, other options that RTD is gonna help the county pay for the, the taxis. But the, the district goes up to the Continental Divide. There's a huge area that's no one. Um, so just sort of, as you're looking at this, you know, you, you kind of have to look at the, at the specific areas within some of these areas. Yep, that's fair, Lynn. Thank you for bringing that forward. Jackie? The other, I think the really good points have been made by everybody, but uh, to, the, to the idea that transit provides a benefit to the whole region, regardless of, of uh, whether people use it on a daily basis or once a year or wherever, I completely agree with that. So then that even goes to uh, who should be paying into this system, much like we have statewide transportation funding for our highway system. Is there some element of this that should be funded at the state level, uh, particularly given the uh, air quality and greenhouse gas emission uh, the targets we're trying to meet and the fact that we're not meeting them? So, uh, you know, I do think that is something that should be considered as part of this is that it should, should it just be folks within the, the much as we all enjoy going up to the mountains and having access to all the beautiful recreation and nature. Folks living up there also come down into this area to access, whether it's our wonderful sporting venues or the airport or visiting family or whatever. So should there be some state, is it unreasonable that there should be some statewide funding for a transit system that provides some, the same kind of service that our highway system provides the much smaller scale? So to me, I think we're better off charging a broader number of folks than having a district. Uh, and I completely agree with Elise as far as level setting expectations for people. Like if you, if you, you know, this is the service you're going to be getting and this is why it's of value to you. Um, so. Great, thank you, Jackie. Um, I think that um, I, I agree that, you know, the, community education around, you know, what should your expectations be? Um, but I think there's no one on this call that would dis disagree with you, Jackie, around transportation funding, um, just in general, um, and how we'd like to see more of that. And so um, I think that you do bring up some great points that this is an entire system that we're trying to maintain, um, and it benefits so many of us. And so um, I don't, I'm not sure if that could be part of a recommendation or not, or where that would even go, but I think it's an obvious need um, across the system. Um, so as we continue this conversation, thanks for everybody who spoke up. Um, we all, I think, are on the same page of 
you know, the value of a transportation system and the network. Um, and then moving forward, continuing to talk about that right sizing and what does that look like? Um, it's great to hear that this is going to be part of the reimagine um, process as well. Um, and so, uh, other, so focusing in on that right sizing, is there anything else that we need from staff as we want to continue on that conversation? We only have a little bit left in this call, but I want to just make sure that we'll have the resources we need to continue a conversation and ask additional questions from staff um, as, as we move forward here. So I have one comment that I actually do think it makes sense as a recommendation coming from this body for the state to have a conversation about whether or not it makes sense to have statewide funding for a transit system. And it doesn't just mean the metro area's transit system. I mean, there are other transit agencies serving other entities throughout our state. And so is that something that we should be doing now as a society, as a, as a state. And I think we should ask that question. Mm -hmm. And then my other comment is I'd like to really understand as we talk about right sizing or the right size is understanding zoning and growth expectations and, and what, um, how that, making sure we factor that in when we talk about right sizing. So if we, again, to my comment 10 years ago, my community wouldn't have made sense to have a light rail line and, and we have it and 10,000 jobs, stones throw from it. Plus that's not even the housing that's around it. So we have to factor the, the growth. We are the, the fringes where we've got these lower densities are also parts of our region that are growing and, the, and it's planned growth and it's thoughtful growth. It's not sprawled growth. And we need to make sure that however we size this transit district, we're keeping the anticipated growth in mind. I agree, yeah, there's a lot of areas that are still booming, especially in Adams County. We're seeing lots of growth. So how do we you know, anticipate um, those needs coming down the line? I think is important. Any other thoughts? Go ahead, Rhett. You know, I hate to be the wet blanket in discussion of statewide taxes, but you know, I got a lot of this white hair here sitting in November, you know, li listening to the returns come in on statewide, uh, statewide initiatives to provide more funding for education or transportation or, or whatever else. These are really, really hard things to get the people across the state to support a higher tax for, or some part of their taxes they're already paying. You know, even in the legislature, it's it's really it's a tough sell, and um, I don't you know I don't want to say we shouldn't try. I'm just saying, you know, it's hard. It really is. A lot of yeah. I think it's, yeah. After the losses we've seen over the past couple of years, it's kind of tough to keep motivated on this. Um, Elise and then Deborah, I'll go with to you. Oh, okay. Rep, rep, did you want to respond, Deborah? No, okay. I'm sorry, my hand's been up. I guess you can't see it because it's brown and it's camouflaged with the brick. That's all. Oh, is that showing up on your screen? Oh yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, yeah thank you. Up. But that's okay. I'll I'll yield the floor. It's a committee mm -hmm. member. That okay. is a metaphor too rich to ignore. You go first. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Um, so yes. thank you all. Uh, first and foremost, just for my edification, I say this not as the CEO of RTD but basically because the committee has been in existence before I got here. So I'm trying to discern as we talk about right sizing and we're talking about geographic boundary, boundaries, what is the issue we're trying to solve for? Because from a transit management aspect, there's a myriad of different issues. And so as we talk about what's needed from staff, I'm trying to discern what are we trying to do here? What is the outcome in which we're trying to achieve? Because I think that would better provide us with a framework relative to what it is we should be asking to better garner an understanding. It's not just district boundaries. It's not just the size. It's not just density. Are we looking at a certain service level from which you would start basically with the schedule and then discern? So for me, there's a lot of missing puzzle pieces here as we look at what we're trying to address. And so I was sitting here listening to the conversation and that's why I had my hand up earlier because I, I just don't have a clear cut understanding of what it is we're trying to do. Because even if we look at peer agencies and we do have that information from Reimagine RTD, 
we're comparing apples and fish in some entities because I can speak to, you know, I was in San Francisco, 49 square miles, which is all densely populated and carried a million people a day. And so basically on the contrary, worked in LA County. That is a service area of 20, 1200 square miles. But on the flip side, basically San Francisco's ridership was very competitive with LA and it was a bigger service area. So, you know, it's like comparing apples to fish. What are we really looking at here? Because those numbers really don't say what we intend them to say because there's so many unknown variables of which we have yet to discuss to get us where we need to be. So I just throw that out for consideration and ask the question, what are we trying to solve for? Thanks. So if I can jump in, thank you, Deborah. I think that's a really good point. And um, I, I sometimes wonder on this question as well. Um, but I do think we do have to manage expectations. I already said that earlier. I did want to speak to Rhett's point the transportation funding legislation that's pending in the legislature now is not going to go to the ballot. It's about fees, and the legislature can and can do that. And one of the healthy discussions about that is how much money is going to multimodal transportation. And I think I've said it before. Don't sorry if I'm a broken record. We need to invest in solutions that reduce climate emissions and reduce air pollution. And transit is part of the solution and it's not just our, the people that ride the bus or the people that ride the, the or that um, pay into sales tax. Our, lots of folks are, are benefiting and we need to figure out how to get more dollars into transit solutions. So I think Jackie is absolutely right. This is super timely to be having a conversation about whether or not there needs to be greater investment in transit beyond just how RTD currently gets its revenues. And unfortunately, that conversation is going to be over before we get our final recommendations to RTD and the legislature, because it's going to be, um, you know, done by May probably. But we, I think, we should really think about making recommendations along those lines. I'm totally cutting in line, Julie. But I think what Elise said is really, really important, and action is being taken right now. And so, if this body does want to weigh in on that issue, we have to do it now. We can't wait. And I think. Okay. I think I think we should draft something. Okay, no, I agree. And we could bring it up to the next, um, our next whole meeting um, or even before then. So yeah, no, I, I agree. If, if that's a recommendation we wanna push out of the committee, we should do it quickly because time, time's going quick. Um, Annie, I see your hand up. I just wanted to chime in really quickly that I feel like Deborah's right about kind of framing the debate a little bit around like, are we looking for ridership versus coverage? And if you're interested in more information, I have done research on that and I'm happy to provide more info on that debate. <laughs> okay, I agree. I, I do feel like if we could narrow in this conversation more, I, it would benefit this whole committee and this, everybody who's investing their time in this conversation. And so um, if we are looking at ridership and service levels, then perhaps maybe um, that's where we should be focusing in on versus, um, you know, just the ge geographic <laughs> mammoth of the size of the district that we do have. Um, but it's almost a minimum, the, but Julie, to me, it's a minimum level of service, right? There's got to be some minimum level of service that RTD is going to provide if you're within the district. Now, the service area councils could help identify what that minimum level is, I think, to... Um, I, you know me, I go shorthand. I'm not going to call her Director Geisinger, but I could. But to her point, you know, there's service needs that are unique to her community that are very valuable service and, and folks are willing to pay to be a part of it. But I'm telling you what I hear in Douglas County, people are very frustrated in the Highlands Ranch community and in the Parker community because they don't feel, they feel like their service has continually been cut and gone down and they're still paying the same amount in, if not more. Um, so to me, identifying minimal levels of service uh, in uh, dense areas and in not so dense areas, and, and they will be somewhat unique. Mm -hmm. And has RTD done any work on that already? Like, is there a definition of limit, like the amount of service that somebody should be getting or looked at which communities are not getting any service at all? Or, you know, where, is there any 
I, I, that would be a question, I guess. I would like to see, is there any information about what type of analysis has been done on this topic in the past? There are standard service levels and most, most agencies basically operate under that, but I would have to defer to staff relative to my lack of history here at this organization. Yeah, and okay. And Deborah and Julie, we'll reach out and I'll have a conversation with Bill Van Meter. We'll probably have a sit down, talk about it a little more in time for our next okay. meeting. Yes, <laughs> sounds great. And we are out of time for this conversation, but I think it was a good start on how we wanted to try and hone in on this conversation and how we wanted to narrow down our focus point. Um, and so hopefully, Doug, this is helpful just um, for you on where the committee is trying to lean at in this, in this topic. So um, at this point, I do want to end the meeting. Is there anybody else who wants to share any final comments before we, we wrap up and, and we'll continue this conversation on our next meeting? All right, great. Well, thank you so much for your time this afternoon um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good one.